Hi, everybody. Um, all right, so uh, I love this kind of a gathering because it's in the nexus or the sort of the collective genius of all of us that we can move much faster on these urgent problems that, that we have. And if we can do that, we can really unlock creative confidence in almost everyone all around us. And imagine if everybody's activated in your city or your, your rural area or community doing what they want to do and people are helping them. Uh, the way that sort of the venture capitalists come up, you know, underneath a Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos or Henry Ford, how can venture catalyze your colleagues? You can start to think a little bit about that. So I'm going to run through a ton of concepts really fast uh, using photos um, to really give you guys the breadth of the kinds of stuff we got to see and that we're seeing still around shift seven means and, and we're out kind of trying to continue some of that work that we did in the White House, staying in the places where the techies are a little more rare. So uh, the first slide, there we go. I have to go back because you're not projecting it. Are you guys projecting? There you go. What's over there? Okay, so I see what you're doing. All right, so um, the first slide is just a really funny thing we came across. So sometimes people don't like going jogging. Some people love it, but some people are like reticent. And other people are like, I don't want to pick up the trash. And so apparently in Sweden, people have combined these ideas, and it's called plogging. And all these people are running around picking up the trash in groups. So sometimes you can't imagine what things actually belong together. You know, on, on a more sort of devastating side, uh, this is about sort of two communities in our country. So over here is West Virginia, uh, and over here is Chattanooga, Tennessee. So in McDowell County, West Virginia, one of the challenges here uh, is that nobody's building a WeWork maker fab labby space in that red brick building. And this guy has to go get water for his family in the United States. And yet, if we could get in the car, we could drive over to Chattanooga, and they have the highest speed internet in the Western Hemisphere. Six billion foreign direct investment. We were just up there on the rise of the rest with Steve Case and the teams, and it's just pounding with all kinds of innovation. It's not Silicon Valley, it's Chattanooga. And so what was different about what happened between these two places, it was sort of how they, how they thought of each other as colleagues and neighbors. Um, this next image is really about hackathons and these new methods that exist. We can come together and do a smart wise city event like today and be sort of brainstorming together and talking through and solving. In this case, this is a day every year. It's been going on for many, many years and some people in your city come together, in fact in all these cities, and work together on problems they'd like to solve, really cross-functional. This stuff's not just technical. It's sometimes really not technical, or it's not technical in the way we think of digital. So this is an amazing story from Hawaii about collective genius. So you guys know uh, the movie Moana. Have people seen the movie Moana? Yes. Many children have probably watched it many times. Uh, so this is the story of the Hokulea, which is the same shit, that, that boat that's in the Moana movie, the Polynesian sailing vessels. What this is, is this is the true story of the Hawaiian teams that sailed around the planet these last three years with no instruments, which is so interesting in the age of artificial intelligence that human intelligence is so you know, less known that we had almost forgotten that we could be like, how about like this table and this table? We'll get on the boat I just showed and we'll go in the middle of the Pacific and like, I don't know, which way should we go? Like, think about that. These guys can dead wreck and sail with no compass around the world? That's incredible. And it was 300 different people working together, high focus on apprentice navigators who were coming up into that. And what I love is as they came home, they sailed into the Honolulu Harbor, met by thousands, tens of thousands of Hawaiians who all know about this. And the, grand, the, the president of the University of Hawaii had called a grand challenge to the youth of Hawaii. And they said, you know, let's work on water pollution. In fact, the Alawai Canal behind Waikiki, it's kind of polluted. So why don't we have the Alawai Awesome Challenge? And these are the kids up here, elementary, middle, high, and college, winning awards for the amazing Grand Challenge X Prize-like work that they did on solving that canal. It was brilliant stuff, and now they're working to implement it. You know, people work on magic school bus, like solutions and curriculum from the coral labs. Hawaii lost 35% of the coral reef around the Big Island, uh, around, the, the, around Oahu in the last El Nino, and some hidden figures work, et cetera. So really working together. President Obama was going to Boise, Idaho, and we thought, I wonder how many tech meetups in Boise. I don't know, what do you think, right? It turned out there were 15. One of them has over 800 people in it. The girl development team meets twice a week. These people are invisible to their colleagues in Boise. So what we could do to mix it up? 
How about Gaza? Why don't we see pictures like this of Gaza, of the innovators of Gaza? This is Afghanistan uh, in Herat, which is uh, just about 80 miles from the uh, Iran border on the, on the eastern side, or the western side. They're making startups, they're spinning out uh, of, of the university. I'm from Buffalo, and we have a lot of big buildings. We lost the steel industry, and so stuff's just sitting dormant, right? So people just took back, this is a windshield wiper company, you know, servicing Detroit in the time, and now it's this really cool innovation center. And what's cool is the Erie Canal, which we're really proud of, is now a great place to be. And you can see a little square in the river, which is the new solar city plant. And they're gonna fold 75 trucks a day of solar cells out of Buffalo, solar panels. That's incredible. Lift back, right? Up here in the Superfund site, known as Bethlehem Steel's former headquarters, there's windmills along Lake Erie. So all around the country, just like you guys, things are coming back and we can bring folks in. So actually Matthew and I and others organized uh, in the White House to bring all the meetup organizers from the tech meetups, those Boise folks, together from all these different cities and get them to collaborate and then we put other innovators with them, starting to build a community of practice across the country to more rapidly share, uh, which is a, a move that we can make. This is urgent and sometimes problems that are near each other, you don't see they're related. But this is a, sort of adjacently looking at there's as many open STEM jobs as people in prison. And every time we teach tech and confidence and skills in prison, we get 7% or even 0% recidivism. We were on the tech jobs tour in Seattle. They have 0% recidivism in the code boot camp that they teach in, in, in prison. So maybe that's the future workforce. So all these people are sitting in prison who ought to be in your company. How do you move them out of there and give them into your company, right? That's an incredible talent pool. Uh, probably some of them need different things, but most of the people there just didn't get the right path. So we went on a tech jobs tour all over the country. We went to 25 different cities. It was based on some work from the White House called Tech Hire, which is really getting people in a community to meet each other. The local boot camps like Flatiron School and other kinds of touring who are working. The municipal folks who don't always know about this work, right? The companies who think, I can't hire from a three month class. And yet you can, there's lots of pathways. Melinda Gates was just at Grace Hopper talking about, we gotta open these pathways. We have hundreds of thousands of jobs open. Our companies are starving and there's so much talent and who cares how we get them? Let's just bring them in. You know, we rebuilt the Pacific fleet really fast uh, after Pearl Harbor. We can do things differently. And then of course the techies who are already in town who can welcome them. So this is Cleveland, you know, it's a career fair around, and then it's speed mentoring. We have primary conversations, five minutes times three, uh, with tech folks talking to not tech folks, helping them come in, neighbors help neighbors. Uh, here's Memphis, speed mentoring. Uh, in Oakland, we had 2,000 people show up with lines out the door. It's the most diverse tech event you've ever seen. We did it here in Denver. In this case, we had 200 techies show up to mentor all those people. Get your neighbors into the future of work and do it in a Rosie the Riveter way, like hustle. Um, so that was what the tour looked like, and it's not a new idea. You know, George Washington Carver, after he realized when he took the train from uh, the middle of the country to Alabama to join Booker T. Washington at St Tuskegee on the faculty, he realized that we were very malnourished and that the U.S. was in a, a grave challenge of uh, a dust bowl because we were a monocrop culture. So he went into the lab. He's kind of the peanut guy. He's really like, how about we rotate crops guy? And what could I use that would be in the money that would nitrogen fix the soil? And that's what he did. Invented all this stuff, and then he had to get the word out. So he got money from a venture capitalist named Jessup in New York who funded him for this Jessup wagon. He went around the country training 2,000 farmers a month. And that became what grew into really what fueled ag extension, right? And so what is tech extension? What would we do like Carver? How would we think like him? Here's Cheyenne, where's Mayor Orr? Yay, so we were up in Cheyenne for the tech jobs here. You see us in the train depot, all the folks in town. It's so fun. And then we do a crawl or a walkabout. Just extraordinary things going on. One of my favorite things is I often, I often carry a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino, and I was in a Title I school, elementary school, talking to teachers. I pulled it out. We were talking to the kids, like, what would you guys do with this? And they were saying, well, maybe we could use technology to end gun violence. Maybe we could use technology to end hunger. Maybe we could stop police brutality. I mean, they were game on, and they were in fifth and sixth grade. And the other thing I loved was the teacher pulled me inside. She's like, oh, we're doing Arduino next week. So people in this country 
are getting the things done, we have to sort of scout for the Zuckerbergs like that teacher and scale them. Because we have so many problems to solve, it's too hard to like look down and work on. We can look up and be like, what do you got? Oh, could you all meet each other? Let's go. So other places from around the country, this is Memphis. They have a really cool space called Start Coast on the Mississippi. One of my favorite companies from there is uh, a combination of two companies. It's a group called Code Crew and a group that builds uh, stuff inside of uh, container ship containers. If you go inside that container ship on the Mississippi next to the playground, there's a coding school. The kids are all inside here, not on the playground. It's incredibly fun. They also lifted some of the hidden figures on the wall. So this is up in Appalachia. This is in Pikeville, a tiny town. Uh, where some former coal miner entrepreneurs founded a tech company called BitSource, Drill Bit Source Code. They advertised for the jobs. They had 12 jobs. They got 800 applicants. The first job was to learn to code. They're in the Coca-Cola bottling company. And they do all kinds of cool stuff, reshoring jobs to America in coding, including uh, this thing that they built, which is this kind of a Facebook-like uh, app about all the challenges in, in Appalachia and who's doing what. Again, rapidly sharing with each other and using tech for this. This is Idaho, Coeur d'Alene. So this was a, a building that a couple of boomerangs got. So a boomerang is a person, I'm from Buffalo. If I went home to Buffalo, I'd be a boomeranger. So these boomerang families, three families moved back and they bought this building for 80K, put a couple million dollars into it and turned it into the coolest tech center. They do not only have startups and all the things you would expect, uh, share spaces, they have a speakeasy in the basement and the University of Idaho Computer Science Department moved in there. And uh, every day they do creative and coffee and people just show up on Monday for coffee and people raise their hand with a problem and they solve each other's problems. It's brilliant. So Nick got an idea like how could we get the rest of Idaho into this place because I don't want my state down. So he invents this thing called Inspire Idaho organizes his team into five groups, divides the state up, and in three days they did 57 events with Apple, the University of Idaho Extension, us and them, and basically show up in town and for an hour advertising on radio say, anybody want to join this tech world? And then really help people using iPads and Spiros to try learning coding and imagine and get the confidence that they could try, form book club equivalents, and now there's 700 people in Idaho co-learning to code in all these towns. I was in the Indian Reservation uh, and Plummer, where uh, 40 folks showed up in a town of 1,000, and now people are learning. Of the 700 people learning to code together, where Apple beams in in video, other people can do that, we see extraordinary things, like 30% of the people are making less than 20K. So people are redesigning their downtown. Uh, you guys are doing this. This is a, a really cool school in southern Dallas on Rise of the Rest who took their football field and they were in a food desert, so they turned it into an entire farm with hydroponics. The kids are learning that and doing internships. Around the corner, there's AJ who's making posters to try to get himself a job. And we could put all these posters all over our city. So how are we thinking really creatively with whoever's already here? With the sustainable development goals from the UN, we, uh, Susan, who's here, who's from the UN and now works with us Ship 7 also, uh, we just put up a website and said, world, what are you already doing to solve the sustainable development goals? And we got incredible things like this team that's flying drones to plant a billion trees a year. These, they're teaching law in prison in Uganda. Thousands of people get themselves out of jail. There's a floating fab lab in the Amazon so that people don't have to cut down trees. They could have that job. And you guys innovated, and so where's Nina? So uh, I don't know if she's in here, but the, there, the University of Denver team welcomed some of those entrepreneurs here and did an entire Solution Summit boot camp with your entrepreneurs and just mixed it up brilliantly and then did a Colorado Solution Summit. Um, we just did some work with MIT Solve team just asking the Lakota people in the Dakotas, those Shadishikone folks, what do you got? And these are just some of the things they wanted to work on, come up underneath them. We could either cut down all the trees or we could start to have different kinds of jobs, right? And that's what this is about, a floating fab lab and the maker movement, the maker spaces that are out there. The South Americans are cross-organized. So it's really exciting to see what's going on and yet our institutions stay so rigid. Right, so that's Burning Man, and that's the Zatari refugee camp. But they're the same size and the same number of people and the same budget. But how come one is governed one way and the other is governed the other way, and could we use our modern ways of governance? And it's not a new idea to upgrade. In the first penny from America, this is Franklin, uh, Jefferson, and Washington, they actually wrote liberty, this is 1792, is the parent of science and industry. So they speak to us about innovation related to liberty. They also, in Washington, in his first State of the Union, said there's nothing which better deserves your patronage than science and literature. 
Knowledge in every country is the surest form of first basis of a public happiness. Fake news. Right? If we can't actually know things, we can't bring our passion, we can't have our liberty. It's really interesting to pull this stuff forward, and it's not partisan. You know, here's President Reagan with Grace Hopper. These are kids uh, in the science fair. President Obama is asking them, like, what'd you guys make? Page turn and robot from Oklahoma. How'd you do that? We had a brainstorming. <laughs> then what'd you do? We built some prototypes. I mean, what if you were this age and you made prototypes and brainstorming? And so we worked on all the frontiers, you know, local cities. There's so much cool stuff going on, and yet people feel this way. So how do we reach out to our neighbors and include them and not have AI be like transformers, right? And how do we realize that our, our congressional leaders are getting further and further apart and help them come back together? Uh, getting, you know, coming to love and hate whoever's in the White House, depending on what your vantage point is, instead of being more reasonable. And look at what AI can do on the downside. Weapons of math destruction. You know, this is incredible work by Joy Bulan Winnie. She just rewrote the Ain't I a Woman speech from Sojourner Truth, AI, Ain't I, because Michelle Obama and Harriet Tubman and uh, Sojourner Truth and all of these people, uh, modern people, Oprah, are not seen by AI at the same level as white men, which are at 99% recognition. Black women, maybe more like 70% or 50%. So do we want self-driving cars to hit some people and not others? Like, what's our plan? Because this stuff is racist and sexist and ageist and all the things we are, because it's learning from us. And we got to figure out, how do we have our values in this stuff? The systems are cruel, even if the people are kind. So we got to work on these things as a group and use all these crazy new methodologies of sprints and hackathons, just like our policy and granting. And you know, hearing Robin talk about procurement, let's just upgrade it. You know, Lincoln got the Pony Express and he moved to the Telegraph. Let's do that too. You know, and we can bring technical people into our teams because America makes such great stuff. So let's have them serve just like military service. And let's work on these topics in really cross-functional teams, you know, upgrade our different services so that we have engaging sites and we have analytics on government sites. We upgrade from crappy forms that roll out the door to like really cool Amazon-like services sign up for our city government. And you guys are doing a lot of that here in Denver. This is extractive industries and opening up APIs for college opportunities. The US Census is the biggest data anything. Right, so we were able to do opportunity.census.gov. And instead of having the poor HUD team, housing and urban development, say, oh, I got to make a website for housing mobility and affordability, we can say, actually, what are you trying to do? That? OK. Airbnb, Redfinzilla, could you come over here? And they could sit down and say, what data sets do you have? And they could start adding features, which they did. You know, here's Redfin adding opportunity score. And this is happening all over the world, even if it's quieter. But really, it's in the seed stage or Series A in almost every country. And the techies are wiring with each other, and it's exciting. You can open up a data set about income, and you could hack the pay gap. And all of a sudden, you could have apps all about solving the pay gap, in addition to the policy work and the legal work and the other pieces. Play the whole orchestra. You can have a data science cabinet, because being in a cabinet is cool. And if you have the NASA and the NIH and these other teams in with Department of Labor and others, they can start being a community practice that can share with each other and build rubrics together. You know, we could redesign the Ebola suit really rapidly through a hackathon and an open grand challenge like XPRIZE, which is really how this happened. Grace is in 10th grade. She's teaching the police chief how to code in New Orleans here, right? Because Dallas and some of the cities are releasing open data. And so you can take use of force data, open, you know, officer involved shooting these data sets and get the cities to start opening them up so we can see what we're doing to each other and start to try to debug our behavior, right? And use this stuff together. And now we have all of these jurisdictions, not with a best practices guide, which they also have, and not with a playbook, but those sit inanimate unless you create the humans connections. So now they're in a community of practice like Rotary, right? And they share things, they share what's working. We do the same kind of work with AI. AI could be terrible and destroy humanity, Stephen Hawking, Elon, or it could be great. And we don't know which one. It's going to be both, probably. And so what are we doing? What's our CNN town hall for that? And we did that all over the country. You know, how do we include our churches in this conversation, in our neighborhoods? We don't think of them. Poverty, hunger. We think of self-driving cars and ad tech, but we could do it all. We could include the kids in active STEM. These are chief science officers. You guys should start doing that here in Denver. There's 150 of them in Phoenix. 
middle school and high schoolers, just like a high school you know, president or treasurer, and they're elected and they do incredible things. There's the XQ super schools, which are rapidly sharing what's working and fueling teachers who are innovating. Um, you know, this is one on environmental justice in Houston. You have one here in Denver. This is one with internships in Iowa. Just great schools, and these are public schools. You know, redesigning engineering, University of Denver is this. This is Northwestern. Usually in engineering school, you have to learn all this stuff, and then senior year, you get to do the cool project. Why are we doing that? How about in kindergarten, we do the cool project and learn the stuff. Cool project, cool project, cool project. Right, make them these real projects that really matter, and use this technology not just to train you know, sort of the open source community, but get the teachers talking to each other. All Kids Computer Science, Wyoming has passed uh, all kids, computer science coding, computational thinking from kindergarten, state law. Amazing, right? In Chicago, you can't graduate from high school without learning to code. Um, there's amazing uh, pro programs going on. This is a new movie, I encourage you guys to see it. Okay, so last riff is really about what happens to some of the people. So we're in kindergarten, and we all feel like we're ready to go. We got our capes on. Let's go. And what happens? This is what happens. We start to accelerate some people and decelerate others. And it's no one's fault, but it's what we inherit. This is movie data. On TV, on screen, the square is men's lines to women's lines in children's TV. And then when we grow up, this is 2,000 films, men's lines to women's lines. So we're teaching each other as children that men speak much more than women. And when we grow up, we're making the same landscape. And that's our textbooks, that's our meetings, that's our companies. So we've got to debug this data. So I wanted to just riff some history with you guys. Ada Lovelace wrote a paper in the 1840s when Darwin wrote. And her paper was 55 pages. She wasn't really allowed to write a paper as a woman, but she attached it carefully to a translation about the analytic engine. It's the first fundamental paper on computer science. Ada was known to say, I wish to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. That is AI. And so she signed her initials AAL, like JK Rowling, because no one would read something written by a woman, right? So she did that. And it's a truth. It's true that a woman founded computer science. Turing refers to her. And we have to know that. We have to know that men and women are, and intersexual people are awesome, right? Everybody's always been awesome. I like her hair, too. <laughs> you know, that, that the first heart surgery was done by these two surgeons. And unfortunately, you know, Vivian has to stand behind. He's not allowed to touch the patient, but he's allowed to coach because of racism in the day. There really were women chemists, right? Images matter. You know, the woman who brought ecology to America, Ellen Swell Richards, you know, measured the first water in Boston and then what is sewage treatment and what is called normal life science. Ida B. Wells, one of the greatest American data scientists. She used data science and journalism to stop us from lynching people. She is the first Black Lives Matter person in the 1890s. And in fact, what's interesting with her also is that in The Devil in the White City, if you saw that book, or 1892, the Chicago World's Fair, Tesla, who I love because he lit, he lit Buffalo using Niagara Falls, right? Immigrant American innovator. Tesla, Edison, all that. Ida and Frederick protested the Chicago World's Fair. Why? African American people weren't allowed to exhibit. There's a beautiful document on the internet that lists all the inventions, sculptors, philosophers, architects, everybody who would have shown in that booth, and they weren't allowed. And it's still true. This is CES in January, this year, right? So we're still doing this. Some people get to do things and some people don't. And it's just not right, and it's not fair, and it's also economically idiotic. So it's not okay that Twitter's 1% black. So we gotta know that everybody's amazing. This is Susan Wright, the mechanical genius mother of Wilbur and Orville. This is a, a Rise of the Rest bus where we saw someone from the Jane Addams world. Jane Addams invented social work. You know, and, and she was in industrial Chicago, and she used data science. So if we know that all this stuff is intersectional, you know, the sustainable development goals for the UN are all these topics. And I'm in the National Academy of Engineering, and I noticed they had a subset of the topics, which were important. But smart cities are not just engineering. They're smart, wise cities. They have justice and transportation. They have great engineering and great housing. You know, they have great water and great humanity. And so we want to make sure that not just one group of people, this was who had judged, and it was 12 white and Asian men, four underrepresented men, two women of color, and, or two white women and no women of color. We want to blend the team so we have everybody at the table setting the goals and making the stuff. 
So, you know, Turing, and uh, this is from the imitation game. These are the people who cracked the Nazi codes. Two thirds women. Princess, the Duchess of, of Cambridge's grandmother and great aunt were there. You know, that, that women have done this work before. This is the ENIAC in the US. Um, that the Mercury 13 and 7 were the first astronauts in our country. That the MAC team was gender balanced. Uh, that, uh, you know, people have done incredible things forever. And we need to know our history so we know our future will include everyone, like Katherine Johnson, you know, who took us to the moon. Uh, or Margaret Hamilton, who's now a Lego, standing next to her code for the Apollo command modules, the lunar lander, and Skylab. Um, and so we're using AI with USC to measure movies to see if we can help ourselves. You know, these are speaking lines by gender and race for Star Wars across time. So I'll, I mean, and there, I, I believe in doing a lot of studio-like work like we're doing today, ecosystem work of connecting each other, and storytelling so we could more rapidly share. And that's something that Shift 7 is working a lot on. Because everybody's out there, and this was an amazing moment. Uh, we were up on the maker stage. These are some of the kids from Black Girls Code. And uh, Olivia had made this cool game that's a little bit like Flappy Birds. Kimura's app was taking her phone, and it was letting you listen in the room for domestic violence. And it would ask you if you wanted to call the police or you needed help. I mean, what if Alexa and Siri could figure out how to do that, including the right kind of privacy settings to really help people? But we wouldn't have thought of that app if the kind of domestic violence and other folks are not sitting next to the Alexa team or in it or cross-pollinating in all those ways. But the kids will think of it. So let's scrub them in and let's scrub all of us in. And I'll end there and thank you very much for having me.